All right. <clears throat> welcome, everybody. It's a delight to welcome you to our last SODA symposium in this semester. The topic for today is gathering and sampling social media streams, something that many of you around the University of Maryland campus, but also many of the social scientists outside of campus do think about, um, worry about, try out new things. And so it's pretty exciting uh, for me to see the large interest in the seminar. And I'm very glad that uh, we have um, two wonderful speakers to share their work and uh, enough time at the end for a Q&A with them. Um, if you wanna post questions while they are talking so that we can field them in the Q&A at the end, you see at the bottom of your screen, the little Q&A box. And, you know, frankly, after a year in the pandemic, you probably all have done this multiple times, but, you know, just to make sure. Um, the, I will call up both panelists on the podium uh, at the end, and then I will field your questions to them. So um, I'm going to introduce the panelists, and uh, if you want to turn on your video screens, um, make sure everyone uh, can see you. And um, I, our first speaker will be Trent Buskirk. Um, he is the Novak Family Professor of Data Science uh, and Chair of Applied Statistics and Operation at Bowling Green State University. Trent and I uh, know each other for many years. Um, through APOR, the American Association of Public Opinion Research. You see a little sock in the background. That's uh, from the recent conference, some Davos Analia. But um, more importantly, Trent's research involves applications of machine learning and data science, a methodology to design, evaluate, and analyze data from all fields, health, social science, survey research. He works on design and development um, of new methodologies and data collection including Peridata to evaluate the quality of the data collection. And he most recently investigates methods for improving inferences that can be derived from big data, social media, and other forms of non-probability based data. Our second speaker um, is Ed, Edward Summers. Uh, he's research faculty member at the Maryland Institute for Technologies in the Humanities here at the University of Maryland. Ed is a software developer, teacher, and researcher working on the intersection of libraries, archives, and the World Wide Web. So, you know, perfect combo here. Uh, he, in his research, he studies how the web functions as a socio-technical system, especially with regard to memory practices such as curation and preservation. So, you know, for all of us who like to uh, sample and archive those tweets, um, pretty relevant talks. So without further ado, I'll um, ask you, Trent, to take over and I'll turn off my mic and um, camera and the floor is yours. Thank you, Frauke. Let me share my screen here. Okay, hopefully everybody can see. Uh, again, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here to talk a little bit about some work that we've been doing since uh, the COVID pandemic started. Um, this work would not have been possible without the help of my um, BGSU COVID team. So the members uh, I want to just thank are uh, Brian, Ravi, UG, Herb, and Adam. Uh, really, really helpful team uh, doing tons of work in this area. Uh, I just want to start with saying that it might be time for Twitter. Um, did you know that people used to write notes on paper and secretly pass them around in class? What? When did that supposedly happen? I don't know, but it must have been BT. BT? before Twitter. Um, since you're all muted, I'm just going to assume and impute laughter in my own microphone so or headset, so let's keep going. Um, as you all may know, uh, <clears throat> Twitter and social media use is on the rise. Pew estimates that about 70% of US adults use some sort of social media, and not all users use at the same rate, obviously. A 2017 survey of 300 medium to large businesses conducted by digital marketing uh, at Clutch found that about 79% use uh, Twitter for social listening activities, 
25% use a social listening to improve products and about 21% use social listening to improve customer experience. The use of Twitter goes well beyond business sector. It goes into the social sciences and so on where we're trying to see more and more inferences coming or drawn from Twitter or things that we can learn uh, from Twitter or use Twitter as potentially a qualitative assessment of our focus groups or our questions, et cetera. Um, and, but, but despite all of that sort of activity, there has been um, a little bit uh, less work really focused on how to create samples from Twitter that, that describe, um, that have desirable properties of representation and replication. Um, Hino and Fahey in 2019 did something like this with, where they actually created an archive of Twitter data uh, that represented the user population. Um, and and the, the, the difficulty here is that um, Twitter actually has limits on the number of public tweets that are available for folks. And so if you're trying to sample with respect to the number of tweets that a potential user has available on Twitter, all those sampling weights are capped at the 3200 limit at one time. Um, uh, Berzovsky and others um, in 2018 applied a similar approach taking a systematic sample of Twitter user IDs, again, focusing on the user, and built a sampling frame uh, to gather tweets from those users. In our work, we've taken a very different view of the Twitter space. We actually are gonna focus on sampling tweets rather than users from a particular day and geographic region. So in our preliminary work, we discovered from the work of Pfeffer and colleagues in 2018, a connection between the time of day and the tweet ID. In fact, the first uh, 42 bits of a 64-bit tweet ID contain a timestamp of when the tweet happened. So by using that information, we can create synthetic tweet IDs to use as placeholders for time-based samples of tweets. So that's really what we're gonna focus on in our talk today. Our goal is to create a sample of tweets that reflects the volume of total tweets over a given day from a given region. We're doing this because people may wanna study Twitter locally or they may wanna study it globally. And so this gives you the flexibility to hone in on a region and a time day, a time element. It doesn't have to be a day, it can be longer than that, but we are thinking about Twitter volumes and being able to represent these things accordingly. So our focus has been on or, or was on the day and region. And we again created these synthetic tweet IDs that were based on times that we wanted to, to sample from. And then we were able to um, use the Twitter APIs uh, to, to pass this through. I think Ed is gonna talk a little bit about the Twitter um, uh, API version 2.0, which has a time-based element in it, but the Twitter uh, API version 1.0, upon which this work is based, does not have that element uh, in it. So we have to create a way to select time as opposed to tweet IDs or user IDs. The Twitter, um, so essentially we're going to incorporate time into the method. The Twitter volumes are converted to corresponding time intervals. So the idea here is that we would be looking at the Twitter volumes and lower volumes in the day would be wider time intervals and higher volumes would be narrower time intervals. And the idea is to get um, to cluster time intervals with respect to about the expected number of tweets, about the same number of expected number of tweets in each of these intervals for the idea that when you query Twitter with an API, there's a limited number of tweets that you can get returned from a given query. We set that limit to be 100, which was the maximum for the version 1.0. Um, it can be uh, set to higher with the version 2.0, which I'm sure Ed will discuss a little bit later. We'll then sample these time intervals that we call tweet PSUs. Again, these time intervals are created such that the expected number of tweets that occur in those intervals is approximately 100. This creates efficiency in our gathering algorithms so that we can maximize the yield that we get from the Twitter API. We're calling this algorithm velocity-based estimates for sampling tweets, or otherwise shortened to be uh, VBEST. So the algorithm uh, occurs in several steps. The first step is that we select an initial set of tweets from uniform time points across the day. We use about uh, 48 of these time points randomly, uh, um, uh, uh, uniformly spaced from across the day. 
and we pull two queries, each of 100 tweets, um, each at each of these selected time points by using the conversion of the time point to the tweet ID, and we, we use the Twitter search API for this. And then the second step, we actually use the returned tweets to estimate the velocity by which the tweets are coming in at a given time point. So we have timestamps on all the tweets coming in. We know how long it takes us to get these 100 or 200 tweets. We take that information and we calculate a velocity uh, of tweets per second in that time interval. Using these tweets per second, we then estimate a velocity, a Twitter velocity curve using a locally estimated scatter plot smoothing or low S uh, with a polynomial regression fitting machine learning algorithm. This gives us an overall velocity based curve estimate for the number of tweets or the velocity of tweets per day. The area under this curve is mathematically equivalent to the number of tweets uh, that are represented in a given day and a region. So we use the area under that curve to come up with these time intervals that have expected number of tweets to be 100 each. So this is the idea. Um, I will skip this here for the visual, but essentially Twitter starts at the end of the day and works its way backwards. So this is how you're going to see us talk about this. Um, and then when we select a time point, we gather tweets in that time point. We have a we have a, a first timestamp. We have the last timestamp from the last tweet. We know how many tweets we've gathered. We can calculate a velocity. We use that velocity as input into our next step, which is to create um, the overall curves, the overall uh, a Twitter velocity curve. Then we create a sampling frame of primary sampling units called tweet PSUs. Um, and we estimate the area under this velocity curve using a three point trapezoidal rule over 86,401 second time point intervals. And then we actually get these PSU boundaries that are essentially time points that correspond to uh, times of the day where we expect to get about 100 tweets per uh, tweet PSU. Then we take the VBEST sample. The VBEST sample is approximately a 25 to 50% systematic sample, at least that's what we've tested, of tweet PSUs uh, taken throughout the day in a given region. The upper endpoint, the rightmost endpoint of each selected tweet PSU is then the timestamp that we use for querying Twitter to gather those tweets um, that we would expect from, uh, from Twitter itself using the Twitter search API. And the collection of resulting tweets from processing all of the queries throughout the day is going to be our VBEST Twitter sample. We also have a variant of this where we're taking a simple random sample of these tweet PSUs as opposed to a systematic sample, and we're going to compare them. So using this algorithm, we've actually, and just to give you an idea, this is the um, Twitter velocity curve that I mentioned. We integrate this curve and we come up with um, a Twitter PSU that essentially is an interval that has an expected number of tweets to be 100 using our projected Twitter velocity curve that we used or we, we um, estimated using those Twitter velocities in the beginning. So this is just an illustration of how accurate this lowest curve is. Here are the 48 time points in Atlanta on November uh, 5th, 2020. We've estimated the velocities here. This is our lowest curve that sort of fit to these velocities. And then underlying this, uh, these green bars is the, actual is the actual volume of tweets that came in when we did a census on that particular day. And you can very clearly see that the lowest curve estimates the Twitter volume very, very closely. We've done this repeatedly over a field peer of a pre experiment, and we've been able to estimate that our error in getting this Twitter distribution correct is about two to five percentage points overall consistently over about a 90 day period. So we think that this tool is actually, it shows a lot of promise. So we wanted to test it in an experiment. So what we did was we actually used six different methods for sampling. Um, the first three, uh, the first three, popular, mixed, and recent, are the Twitter default methods that you would get if you tried to log into Twitter and used it yourself. Um, you could pick one of these three methods for gathering tweets. Uniform and SRS with the VBEST sampling frame and the VBEST samples are the new things that we're trying to test here. Uniform is just simply selecting uh, time points that are uniformly spaced throughout the day and then querying those time points um, to, gather the, to gather the tweets. We also tested sample sizes of 720 tweets, 540, uh, sorry, 540 queries and 360 queries. The, and for the last two methods, 
we had to subtract 96 from that number to use as the overhead for our lowest curve estimation to build the sampling frame. So the, the, those queries are going to be 444 and 264 and 624 respectively for the number of queries that we would pull to generate our samples. So from there, um, this is just sort of the depiction of these things. So when you gather um, the recent tweets, samples are going to look like this, where it's shaded in. This is where the samples are going to be generated. Uniform is going to be throughout the day. Um, uh, simple random sample VBEST is going to be selecting these tweet PSUs all throughout the day. And then the VBEST algorithm is doing this systematically. So I'm getting sort of more uniform coverage from the full spectrum of the day. Our field period ran from uh, ran for 38 days from uh, just before Thanksgiving to the end of December. And we are looking at five different metropolitan statistical regions here. Um, we did not include Columbus in this one because we had some uh, technical glitches from our vendor. So we won't be talking about Columbus. And then in order to um, gather these tweets, we had to specify a geo center, a geo, uh, geo location. Uh, coordinates for the center of the metropolitan statistical area, and we selected a radius that would be the smallest possible radius to encompass all the principal cities that make up the MSA. So these uh, radii are different for the different MSAs because they have different geographic topologies, so we're using those um, accordingly. And so the idea is that when Twitter draws this using the search API, you have to specify a coordinate and a circle. And then we're going to do some geo filtering based on the user location of the, um, or based on the, uh, the location that is um, recorded in the user metadata for the tweet in order to figure out if they actually, if that tweet is going to be retained for our analysis or not. We did this because our vendor through the fire hose was able to get city-based uh, tweets, and we were not able to get city-based tweets, so we needed this geo-filtering step in order to do that. We also are looking for keyword, a couple of outcomes that we care about are topics related to COVID. So we have a bunch of these, we have eight keyword groups, and then we have the keywords here. So what we were looking for is keyword-based frequencies and keyword a uh, keyword group-based incidences for um, these particular um, uh, groups. Um, we, this was a COVID-related project, and so we were looking at COVID-related outcomes. And so essentially, um, the working keyword group estimate is going to come uh, from whether or not a tweet has any one of these keywords in it. So we don't really care about the individual keywords. We're really caring about these categories. So does a tweet talk about working as defined by these keywords? Does it talk about COVID as defined by these keywords? So what we're going to do to evaluate this is the percent relative absolute bias. So we have an estimate from our Twitter samples. We're going to compare that estimate to what we get from the fire hose from an independent vendor. And we're going to take that relatively speaking to the estimate from the fire hose. We're also going to average across these eight keyword categories just to give you an overall picture of how well the sample is performing. So we gathered our sample tweets and um, I have a little bit of time to tell you these results. In total, we have 100, over 112 million tweets that we've gathered from these uh, metropolitan statistical areas. We filtered them into the principal cities that left us with about 80 million tweets. And then we filtered by keywords to look at these analyses and that left us with about two, two million tweets that actually fell into one of the, the keyword categories that we mentioned. And again, the MSAs that we're considering here are Atlanta, Baltimore, Chicago, Phoenix, and Pittsburgh. So the first, uh, the first um, result that we looked at was just whether or not we can get an estimate of the tweet universe. How big was the Twitter population for a given MSA um, by uh, method and sample size? And so one of the things that jumps out, so what we're estimating here is the Twitter population, the number of tweets that appear in Atlanta MSA from our samples relative to what we got from the vendor. So this was after we had to, we had to geo filter uh, those tweet the, the samples. What you see very quickly is that the mixed method and the popular method, which are defaults in Twitter. In fact, if you don't do anything for the tweet search Twitter search API, the mixed method is the default. Those two methods are horrible on their sample performance relative to the bias. So when we look at the recent method, the uniform, the SRS, and the VBEST, these methods typically are better. But the SRS and the VBEST methods, at least for estimating the, the tweet population or the total size of tweets, 
um, is better than uniform and recent. In fact, recent is overestimating that amount and uniform is underestimating that amount, keeping, uh, keeping apprised um, a that this is the absolute bias, but the direction of that bias is actually different depending on the method that you use. This just shows you a little bit of the breakdown um, in, the, um, in the method and sample size and region um, graph. We do notice that some of the regions behave slightly differently, but the curve is generally the same. Recent is, is um, not as good as SRS or VBEST, and uniform is uniformly bad across these groups for estimating the size, and we'll talk about why that is in just a second. And of course, if you look at the Chicago is the largest area and Baltimore and F Pittsburgh are the smallest areas. And one thing that you notice that is as the sample size increases, recent gets better for generating these estimates of um, Twitter volume. So I'll tell you why that is in just a second. So now we looked again at the <clears throat> overall um, percent relative absolute bias for keyword category frequency. So I cared about the number of terms that were related to COVID or the number of tweets that had a term that was related to masks, et cetera. And I averaged across these eight keyword categories to get an overall mean uh, percent relative absolute bias. And again, the picture is similar. Um, that you see that in um, some of these cases, um, recent is good um, for larger sample sizes in the smaller cities or metropolitan statistical areas, but in the larger ones like Chicago, Atlanta, um, recent isn't as good as SRS or VBEST, no matter what the sample size is, and uniform across all of these is actually doing a poor job at estimating uh, totals, um, frequencies, um, if you will, um, from, from these samples. And again, if I just focus on the recent uniform SRS and VBEST, you're starting to see a little bit of that here. Um, obviously, there is a sample size effect. The more queries that I do, the better the performance, but it, it is not, um, it has some negligible returns for simple random sampling and VBEST um, compared to, say, recent. And I'll tell you why that is in just a minute. Here is um, an example from the Baltimore area. This is one of our smaller MSAs. And if you notice that um, this, this line with the green background, so, so the blue line is representative of the Twitter volume throughout the day. And this is actually from a full corpus of Twitter that we were actually able to gather on a few selected days. At 320 queries, it takes us to about 44% of the volume. At 720 queries, we get to about 88% of the volume. So when we're projecting keyword frequencies using a recent method with a large number of queries, we're effectively covering almost the entire corpus of Twitter. So we're actually getting a reasonable estimate of what's happening by virtue of almost a census. So this is why you get some interaction between the method and the location or the region and the sample size because of the distribution of the underlying Twitter, uh, the Twitter space in terms of when the tweets come in. And one of the, and so if we turn our attention to Chicago, which is a much larger um, area in terms of Twitter volume, you can see that after 720 queries, we're only covering about 22% of all of the tweets in a given day. And we're making projections based on those from our recent samples to the rest of the day, which turns out to be not such a great idea. The uniform, on the other hand, is, is actually oversampling this area in the, what we call the trough region, which is giving us too small of Twitter volume estimates. And we're combining that with larger Twitter volume estimates to get an overall underestimate of what's happening. So this is why the uniform methodology is, or the uniform samples aren't working as well either. We also looked at collecting this, obviously we did this over um, several days. And so this is just a really rough picture of the accuracy of the relative absolute biases by method across the days. One thing that you notice here is that the method that has the most spikes, in other words, it's the method that has perturbations um, that you can actually see um, with the naked eye is the recent method. It is the one where um, it's the most sensitive to Twitter volume distribution changes from day to day to day. So this is actually the deep, one of the default methods in Twitter. And we do see some um, variability uh, in this method with respect to the precision, um, the precision values that we're getting across our field period. And finally, um, if we look at the um, percent 
uh, relative absolute bias by region, method, and size for um, incidence rates, um, we can see that the methods compare are a little bit more comparable in terms of overall estimate of keyword incidence. They don't do as well for frequency. So um, this is what I have to talk about. I'll just give you a couple of takeaways and then I'll turn it back over to Frauke. We analyzed two main outcomes, the Twitter population and then this um, frequency um, of tweets. Um, and generally we had some mixed results, but we did see that the SRS and VBEST methods tend to be more stable and better estimates for frequency-based um, estimation. Um, and the uniform and, and recent are a little bit um, not, they're, they're a little bit more dicey in terms of their accuracy or their consistency. We are doing an experiment to figure out ways to tweak our initial velocity curve estimates to make that better. And we're going in that sort of future work that we're exploring now. So thanks a lot for listening. Hope you enjoyed the talk. Great, thank you, Trent. Uh, this was wonderful. And I'm gonna use this opportunity to tell people here that are listening to this, that Trent and I just got a recent grant awarded and we will be using this methodology to uh, uh, draw samples from Twitter and you know, it's all related to privacy. So if any one of you in the audience is looking for a job, uh, please do apply. We have a job posting out there at SODA. And uh, so, you know, the, this, this can be the beginning uh, for everyone else, but also those, please do post your questions to Trent in the Q&A session and um, Ed, feel free to turn on your video and start sharing your slides. You're up next. Please make you unmuted, yes, thanks, great. So hopefully you can see my screen okay. Yes, we can, thank you. G great. Um, so uh, yeah, thank you for the invitation to, to take part in this uh, event today. Um, and uh, I, uh, you know, it was mentioned in the, in the intro, in my intro, but uh, you know, uh, I work at uh, the Maryland Institute for Technology and the Humanities, which is a uh, a center at the University of Maryland. Um, and I also work as a, an instructor in the um, College of Information Studies at University of Maryland. And in both roles, I, um, I sort of uh, work as a, uh, as a software developer and also um, a, a data practitioner. So I sort of help uh, faculty and students uh, with research that largely involves, uh, you know, uh, studying the web and studying the web as um, a socio-technical system. So, so the different platforms that exist on the web, uh, very often we, you know, people uh, uh, are interested in, in studying them. Um, and Twitter happens to be one that I focused a considerable amount of time on. Um, largely uh, this project called Documenting the Now, which I may mention near the end of the talk if there's time. So uh, the talk, uh, I gave it this title, Notes from the API Calypse, the Twitter version two API. And as Trent mentioned, I am gonna be uh, talking about the version two API primarily, but I, we're gonna kind of zoom out a little bit um, uh, to, to talk about the Twitter platform as a whole. Um, and uh, this picture here on the left is the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Uh, API Calypse is, is a play on words that I'm gonna talk about in a second. It's not something that I came up with, um, but uh, uh, but yeah, the, the basic idea is that uh, this is a reference to the apocalypse. So, um, so we uh, this is zooming out quite a bit, but um, so when we uh, talk about studying social media platforms like Twitter, um, I think that you know. Uh, it's important to, to understand how it's being studied, right? And so when you use uh, social media data like, like Twitter data, um, it's important to know how it's been sampled as we just heard about, right? And, um, and, uh, and so I mentioned this at the beginning because it's important for me and my own work that, uh, that Twitter is not necessarily used as a proxy for the population as a whole. Um, this is a, uh, just a, a graphic from a, a study that Pew Research Center did in 2019, where they surveyed uh, active uh, users of Twitter 
and compared them in a very kind of simple way to sort of demographic characteristics of the United States as a whole. And you can see, you know, the, the in blue, the, the percentages of, of for Twitter users and then in, um, in white, you know, those little circles are for the, the population as a whole. And you can see that, you know, Twitter users skew uh, to the younger uh, demographic. They, they tend to be more educated. They tend to make more money. Um, and, and these things are important, right? When you, when you look at, 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 at Twitter data, um, especially if you're you know, looking at it as a proxy for uh, a population. Um, and, um, but, you know, that being said, uh, you know, and this is really where my research focuses more is um, Twitter is a platform where things happen, right? And so even when you're not looking at it as a proxy for, for the population, uh, you know, there are all sorts of things that are happening on Twitter that are, that are important to study and to, to understand. And um, so that, uh, you know, I, I'm thinking here of, um, you know, like disinformation campaigns, uh, you know, in politics, right? Um, there's there's uh, hate speech and, and uh, spam and various kinds of abuse that happen on Twitter that are really important to study, trolling. So those are all negative things, but on the positive side, there, um, Twitter is used as a platform for activism. Um, I'm thinking here of uh, like the Black Lives Matter movement or the Me Too uh, hashtags, right? These were uh, significant events that, that transpired on this platform that are important to study for, for cultural and political reasons, right? So, um, so that's just a little bit about studying Twitter as a platform. Um, now, uh, you know, I, this is a, um, uh, kind of a, a lovely book that came out, I think, last year from uh, Gene Burgess and Nancy Bayham, uh, entitled "Twitter: A Biography." And they, um, the the book is 280 pages, just like you know there are 280 characters in a tweet. Um, but it uh, it basically chronicles the the history of Twitter, but looking at uh, Twitter through its affordances, so the the types of features that it's acquired and how it's acquired them over that uh, over its lifetime. Um, and one of the things they do early on in the book is um, is sort of just to to, to try to uh, position like why it's important to study Twitter. Um, they did a, a very simple, you know, uh, uh, Google Scholar search for Twitter in the title of any paper, and they found 61,300 papers. And um, I just repeated this a couple of days ago, and I found 108,000 papers. And so, you know, the reason why they did this was because they were trying to point out that this is a very uh, significant platform to study and, um, you know, for, for us as scholars, right? And, and uh, just to put that in perspective, um, you know, I also did a, you know, very simple, similar search for Facebook and that found 103,000 papers, which is slightly less than Twitter, right? Um, about, about the same. Um, but the, the really weird thing about that, at least from my perspective, is that Facebook has uh, order, order of magnitude more uh, users than Twitter does. So, um, you know, Facebook has 2.8 billion active monthly users and, uh, and Twitter has 330 million. Um, that, that's an estimate that I just looked up. But, um, and uh, so, so you'd think that, you know, given the significance and the, the usage of Facebook as a platform that it would be used a, a lot more um, in, in titles in Google Scholar. Uh, but it's not. And um, the, one of the reasons for that, at least that I'm sort of positing here, and I think uh, is fairly, uh, I don't know, maybe we could have a debate about it. But, uh, but I think one of the significant reasons for that is uh, this eight, um, application programming interface or API. Um, and so all these social media platforms make data available to users, to third parties, um, even internally, sometimes within the corporations, um, using these things called APIs. And, um, and that's, that's the, the API clips that I'm going to be uh, talking about here today. Um, but um, uh, APIs, um, you know, we could spend a, a long time talking about this, but I like to summarize APIs uh, uh, when I'm trying to describe them quickly as um, URLs for data. So just like how you have URLs for web pages, um, like, you know, for example, University of Maryland has a, has a URL, HTTP colon slash slash umd.edu, right? And when you point your browser at that location, you get some HTML, you get 
bunch of um, images and CSS and di different things, right? Um, that, that, that your browser then renders as a page. And just like you can have URLs for web pages like that, you can also have URLs for data. And so um, this is just a quick example of that from the Twitter API. This is a, a URL for um, uh, the getting um, the tweets of a particular user from, from the API. And so you see in red there the user ID um, that, the, that is uh, being used to uh, fetch the, or it's, it's designating which tweets to get, so which user. This happens to be uh, Barack Obama's user ID. So when you resolve this URL, if you have the keys to do it, and maybe we'll talk about that a little bit later, um, but, uh, but you, you basically need to have keys from Twitter to be able to get this data um, and from the API. Uh, but once you do, you get back data, that data comes back in what's called um, a, a JSON format, so jo JavaScript object notation. It's, a, it's a, basically a structured metadata format uh, where you can look at the, the data uh, for a tweet um, in, a, in a very uh, sort of programmatic way. Now, um, uh, you know, I mentioned API clips in the title of my uh, talk, and this is a, a term that actually Axel Bruns uh, came up with. Um, I think this was in 2019. Um, and so he, he wrote a paper after the API clips, social media platforms and their fight against critical scholarly research. And um, so his paper is largely about um, the response to the Cambridge Analytica scandal. And, um, uh, and, and basically, Bruns points out that um, after the Cambridge Analytica scandal, a lot of uh, social media platforms decided to restrict access to their APIs in various ways. Um, some of them, uh, you know, removed parts of their APIs. Uh, some, some removed all of their APIs. Some, uh, you know, controlled how much you could access those APIs. Um, and, um, uh, and so he, he points out in this paper that there are kind of like four different ways. I don't know if it applies, you know, if he was <laughs> recalling the four horsemen of the apocalypse, but uh, you know, he, he recommends four different ways of sort of dealing with the situation. Um, and uh, uh, those um, were largely to, um, to either stop doing this kind of research, right, to walk away from uh, doing social media research, um, to try to change the, the actions of the, the, these companies, right, uh, largely through lobbying and political work, right, which I, I think is, is uh, you know, happening at the moment. Um, and uh, you can also work with the APIs that are left, sort of like accommodate uh, the, the, these corporations. Um, and, um, and then the fourth one was to basically break the rules and to sort of work outside of the APIs and um, sort of go against the terms of service by scraping. Um, and I think we've seen some cases about this, uh, you know, recently um, thinking of uh, Christian Sandvig from University of Michigan, his, his uh, his case that I think it was in front of the Supreme Court around scraping and the rights of researchers to, to scrape data. So all of these approaches are uh, appropriate and they're not like, they can be mixed and matched, right? Like it's not like you have to pick one, um, but th these are some of, the, some of the, the avenues that are open to us as researchers. Um, just quickly, if you're not familiar with the Cambridge Analytica scandal, um, so this happened in 2018. 2018, yeah, a, a whistleblower uh, leaked that um, uh, uh, there was a researcher at University of Cambridge in England who also was working as a contractor with um, this uh, company called Cambridge Analytica, who do um, you know lots of political uh, data uh, analytics work, right? Um, and um, uh, that they had uh, basically this researcher, as a researcher, had collected 50 million. Facebook profiles and given that data to uh, Cambridge Analytica. And uh, Bruns points this out in his paper that, you know, the, a, a big deal was made out of uh, this case and rightly so because it was, uh, you know, uh, not a good thing what, what happened, but he points out that this is actually very emblematic of things that were going on all the time, right, uh, with social media platforms. Um, you know, Shoshana Zuboff and her uh, recent book, uh, you know, Age of Surveillance Capitalism. Um, she, you know, highlights how 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 pervasive this this economic model is, right? Like where these platforms are taking our data and then using it to do 
predictive modeling. Um, and um, anyway, so this is just to, to you know, provide that little bit of context to, to, to why um, Twitter and these other social media platforms have uh, decided to, to change their API access. Um, so, uh, you know, fast forward a little bit to earlier this year uh, from Cambridge Analytica. Um, in, um, in January of this year, Twitter announced that they have this new academic research product track, which is uh, a way for researchers to basically uh, apply and get access to uh, their API. Um, and it's not their version one API. So Trent mentioned there's these, uh, there was a version one API and a version two API. Uh, the version two, a they're both currently available, but version two API um, has uh, some things that I'm gonna talk about in a moment here. Uh, but uh, it, it uh, ha yeah, it has some benefits, but some negative aspects to it that, that uh, you probably need to be aware of if you're going to use it. Um, so the you know this academic product track um, it kind of uh, it positions Twitter as a, sort of an arbiter of like what academic research is, which is kind of strange when you think about it. Um, but uh, the, yeah, they are basically when you apply, and it's pretty simple. You can apply in like ten minutes. It's this very simple form, um, and you can. Uh, they basically are looking for evidence that you're an employee, uh, research, a research-focused employee at an academic institution. Um, so like grad student or um, faculty member or, you know, somebody that's doing research. Um, they do ask what your research objective is. So, uh, and I think the more specific you are, the more likely I've heard you are to get granted access. Um, this is basically your research question, right? Um, can be difficult though if you're doing you know multiple projects you know which one do you talk about do you talk about them in the in the aggregate can be a little bit tricky and the other thing is that they uh, are looking for non-commercial uses so um, you know th that also can be tricky you know if you're working with a commercial entity um, you know knowing uh, you know when the boundaries are being crossed or not um, could be difficult depending on what you're doing so the good parts of this uh, academic uh, research product track and the version two API, which I'm kind of lumping together here because of the audience. We're largely researchers, right? Um, there are no more contests for data. So Twitter and other social media platforms were doing this um, for some time where they were, uh, you know, basically asking for people to submit their research ideas and then they would cherry pick, you know, a very few number of them to work with. Um, and so this is much more comprehensive access. Um, it's designed for for lots of researchers to get access to it, um, which is a good thing. Um, you can now search the full archive of tweets. So uh, unless you're lucky enough to have, um, like Trent mentioned, the, the fire, uh, fire hose, which is the, the full you know, uh, access to data, which some institutions do have that, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty rare, I would say. Um, uh, but, um, but yeah, but so, um, Previously, with a version one API, you could only look for the last seven days of tweets through the search API, um, which is pretty problematic if you're looking for historical events that have happened. Um, and now uh, with the version two API, and when you have been blessed as an academic, you can get uh, access to the full archive. Um, there are no more uh, uh, stream volume throttling. So when you are collecting from the live stream of, of tweets, uh, for a very high volume event, like for example, like a, a political debate or a sporting event or something like that, where there uh, were a large number of tweets. Uh, previously, you would get throttled. Um, you basically get a message saying that a certain number of tweets have been dropped. And that appears to no longer be the case with the new uh, version two streaming API. Uh, you can also change your rules for how you're collecting from the streaming API on the fly as you're collecting just kind of nice so you don't have to stop the streaming and then start it again with different set of rules. You can basically change it as you're going. Uh, you can also collect conversation threads. So this is really important if you're doing, you know, any kind of uh, analysis of conversations on Twitter. Um, being able to get a thread was previously kind of difficult with a version one API and now it's uh, quite easy with a version two API. And um, you also get additional metadata now. So uh, people's, places, organizations, they, I think they call these annotations, but they're basically uh, structured metadata for entities that have been recognized. I, you know, take this with a grain of salt because they have their own sort of machine learning uh, processes for identifying these entities. 
um, uh, but it could be quite useful depending on what you're doing. So the bad things, um, uh, the premium product offerings, if you were using them are going away. So the, those ways that you could pay for access to data um, uh, are gonna be phased out, I believe this year. Um, at least if you believe <laughs> what, what they've said. Um, uh, you know, Twitter is a gatekeeper for what is research, uh, kind of problematic, right? Uh, especially if your research is looking critically, you know, as Axel Brums points out in his paper at the platform itself, you know, it's possible that maybe, uh, you know, they, they, they may not grant access uh, depending on what you're looking at. Um, a big one, and maybe if, hopefully there's time for me to talk about this real quickly, but uh, it used to be that when you got the data for a tweet, there was one representation of that tweet as data. And, uh, and you know, it changed slightly over time as they added features and whatnot, but, but you, didn't, you didn't have to ask, uh, you know, no matter how you asked for the tweet, you would get sort of the same basic shape of data back. Um, and that's no longer the case with the version, AT, a, version 2 API. How you ask for the data uh, is very, um, uh, you know, very much shapes like the type of data that you get back. The quotas are much lower, so um, uh, and it's slightly better if you're blessed as an academic researcher. But um, uh, the, the, the so the quotas are basically how much you can get out of the API for a certain period of time. And um, just as a quick uh, visualization of that, um, the the blue line here is the version one API, and the red line is the version two API. And this is just uh, visualizing a month, so how much data you could collect in a month. And um, you know, this is from the search API. So previously you could collect um, from the search API uh, about 140 million tweets per month. And, um, and with the version two API, the search API, you can only get, you know, you get basically capped at, at 10 million. So it's quite different. Um, the same is true for this filter stream API. So that's getting the live tweets from, from Twitter uh, that, uh, you could get um, over, uh, what do I have 350 million tweets there um, in, a, in a month, whereas uh, now you know, you're capped at 10 million. So th th this is a big change um, to how much data you can collect in a month. And this is the ac it, for the academic access. Um, I mentioned the canonical representation is going away, but so just real quickly, just to give you a sense of this, um, when you request uh, data for a tweet, you have to indicate now what expansions uh, you're interested in uh, getting. And so these are basically like ways of uh, it saying that you're interested in particular pieces of data. So um, the attachments or users, um, if there are polls in the Twitter data, uh, you know, what, what tweets are referenced in the tweet. So if it's a reply to another tweet. And for each of those expansions, there are a set of fields that you have to um, also indicate um, that you're interested in. Um, and so there are all these different fields and expansions and it's very complicated. Um, and so uh, this is a big uh, headache for people that are used to getting Twitter data from the API and, and sort of processing it in a particular way because now tweets can take so many different shapes depending on how you ask for it. Um, and uh, maybe just real quickly before I, I finish here, um, I'll just show you a so uh, a, a quick demo of a tool that we call Twork. So uh, I mentioned that I work on this project called Documenting and Now, which is a, uh, a social media uh, archiving project. It's been going uh, for six years, three of which uh, have been here at the University of Maryland. And uh, we've one of the tools that we've developed is this tool called Twork, which is a, a command line tool. Uh, it's actually written in Python. So that's what the snake is doing there. And, um, and it's really oriented around saving data. So that's what the disk is doing there too. So it's um, you know, uh, a tool for collecting the data from the Twitter API. It runs at the command line. So, um, oh, I apologize, you're seeing my email here, but um, yeah, if you haven't opened a, a command line tool before, uh, you know, all, all operating systems have, have something called a, a terminal or a command line. Um, and, and, uh, and this tool basically works uh, that way. Um, and um, once you've got it installed, you can, um, you know, uh, write um, in your terminal twerk2. So that's the, the tool. And then it takes a, a set of uh, subcommands. Um, actually, there's a whole bunch of different subcommands that it can that it can take, which you can see listed here when you do the help.
come in. But um, uh, but yeah, the one of them is search, and so that that interacts with the search API that I mentioned uh, that Trent was talking about too. Um, and um, and you can give it a query. Uh, it could be a simple query like this, right? Like where I'm just looking for COVID nineteen, and um, what it will do is uh, you know connect to the API and then just output it to the screen, which is uh, probably not terribly useful uh, other than to show you that it's working. Um, normally what is done is you will write it to a, a file, right? And, um, and so you can run this uh, command and what it does is this one, because it's using the search API, it's working backwards in time from the current po uh, point in time backwards, uh, looking for tweets that mention COVID-19 and then it saves them to this file COVID-19 JSON L and um, JSON L is just line oriented JSON. That's the format that it comes back from the API. In. And then when you're done, you know you can, if you want, uh, you know you can do a bunch of things with this data. But one thing that you can do is, um, you know, convert it to uh, CSV. Um, and uh, you know this can be useful for uh, looking at it in a Google Sheet or um, you know Excel or uh, you know, lots of data frames. So like in R or Python, like if you want to load uh, a data frames from CSV and analyze it, um, it's super handy for that. That's pretty so, uh, cool. You know, I, could, um, I, I, I yeah. need to make sure I'm not all starting typing with the command lines, but we still have a little bit of time for questions uh, at the end. Yeah, yeah. I'm actually done here. So this is the end. Uh, so that's good timing, I guess. Oh, I, I will mention though, just before I stop, um, that uh, if you want to learn more about the tools, um, uh, there's, there's this URL here, um, docnow.io, uh, that talk, talks about the project. It's actually a, a project that started after um, uh, the killing of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri in 2014. So a lot of these tools were developed um, around uh, collecting uh, activist work that was going on. And so, uh, yeah, let me uh, stop sharing here. Thank you very much, Ed. And I uh, might want to um, look at the q and I think you can uh, share here with uh, the audience the link to your GitHub slides. I, I already saw a couple of people asking for that. Um, Having both of you now back on the podium, um, let me first thank you for two wonderful talks and um, start or make sure that we touch on one of the questions posted, which was sort of related to which vendors are you using? Now, the API is not a vendor, right? We've learned that now, but um, I guess there can be an advantage or some rationale for using vendors here and there. And I was wondering, Trent, if you um, still do that, or if you entirely switched on your sort of own sampling methods? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so to evaluate our methods, we actually, we didn't have um, Firehose access ourselves. And so, and we could do, so we're, since we're using the Twitter version uh, 1.0, we could have actually gathered censuses from the actual Twitter search API ourselves, but this takes an enormous amount of queries. And because we were covering many geographic areas with large volumes of tweets, we didn't spend our queries that way. Um, so we ended up going with the vendor to provide Firehose access to generate these population, so on, um, you know, benchmark quantities that we use to evaluate the sampling methods. And we used actually Meltwater um, to do this, but there are others, the other vendors like Brandwatch, which recently purchased um, um, Crimson Hexagon. So if you're familiar with Crimson Hexagon, it was purchased by Brandwatch. And they actually have an interface that you can buy um, that gives you full, th full throttle access to Twitter Firehose, but also to Reddit and other, other sort of social media platforms. But it's about $60,000 a year, even with academic discounts. So it's not cheap. So we went with Meltwater for this project because it was much more uh, cost effective to generate these estimates. But yes, there is a place for it. Now, one of the things that the literature would tell you is that even if I were to do a Twitter census, which we ended up doing to test this anyway, and you compare it to the Firehose, you will get different answers potentially, because the Firehose vendors, by regulation of Twitter, have to remove tweets that go public or that go private, and they, they're, all, they're constantly sort of curating that Firehose sort of output. So there are some differences that are beyond the control of the researcher, but that's sort of what we have today. 
Excellent. Ed, anything to add to that on the vendor side? Um, no, I mean, uh, that's not interesting to hear about those different vendors. And, um, and I think, um, I, you know, I think of Twitter as a vendor, though, right? Like, um, even though they're vending their own data, like, <laughs> they, fair um, enough. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. a vendor. Yeah. yeah. I and you mentioned, um, what did you call this? All those expansions, and I guess Trent, what you've been using the geographic location is one of those expansions. So, I was wondering, um, Trent, could you see your methodology being sort of expanded to? use some of these other expansions um, that it introduced. And I was also wondering how complete is that? I mean, the metadata are probably have missing data themselves and not all are geotagged. So maybe you can. Yeah, so we didn't use geotagging at all. So our vendor in order to identify sort of location and to be able to make apples to apples comparisons between our samples and the vendor benchmarks couldn't use geotagging information from Twitter. It was part of their terms of use. So we actually based all of our locations on the user metadata with the city name itself. So or did you live in Atlanta or did you live in Chicago? And we actually used our pilot data to amass all the ways people could misspell Atlanta. And we used that in our AI to sort of figure out the locations. But about 60 to 75% of people actually have a user location and that can change over time. And we didn't include retweets because retweets inherit the user location of the person who originally tweeted. And because we were looking for local inference, we excluded retweets to avoid that problem. One thing to mention is that the version two API does not have a geolocation tag a priori as part of the payload. You actually have to filter after you get the tweets. Version 1.0, you can filter at the time of tweet acquisition using um, a geo filter. So that's what we did um, to make the to make it more efficient. That's interesting. Thank you, um, Trent. And one uh, question, last question that we have here in the chat uh, is on sort of ethical considerations. You mentioned uh, the uh, use of social media data for research purposes and then a secondary use to make some additional money or whatever the motivation might have been. Are there any uh, considerations that you would like to give people on the way as they think about uh, using Twitter data for their research? I mean, here too, we know from some studies that not everybody who's using tweet, Twitter is sort of having that in mind that this is really public and can be used for research, for example. Yeah, absolutely, Frauke. And that, that, I think that's the, the, the most important thing to know is that, is that not all users fully understand the, the publicness of their tweets, right? And um, yeah, Nicholas Perferas has a really nice study about that, like looking at user expectations around how Twitter is used. Um, but um, uh, I guess like it, 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 it kind of depends, right? Like I, 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 as with ethics, you know, questions always are, are so, con so the, the context matters so much, right? And um, so, uh, you know, when you're doing statistical work, you know, like Trent was just describing where you're looking at a population and characteristics of a population, the, the ethical concerns there relate, compared to like when you're maybe doing a qualitative assessment of someone's timeline or a conversation, potentially even quoting, you know, tweets and putting them into the research materials, um, they're just so different, right? And I think that a lot of the ethical concerns come into play when the voice of the, the people that are creating the tweets uh, becomes the thing that's being studied. And, um, and so uh, consent becomes very important, I think, when, uh, when, when publishing research about things that people have put online. Um, and, uh, and also, it, it's also important, too, when you're sharing data sets, I think, um, after the fact, the way that you choose to share the data is uh, it, you, you definitely need to think about the ethics of what you're doing when, when that happens. But that'll be like a whole like, whole. Uh, this is yeah, the segue into the next talk starting. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Ed. That, the, the, very thoughtful and I love your distinction on sort of, uh, you know, thinking about the context and the usage of the data um, and not sort of a general assessment. So um, this is super helpful. We are at time. Thank you both, Trent and Ed, um, and thanks to all the participants. Um, again, we will be 
sharing the material for um, the, the recorded videos, as well as the slides on the SODA website. And if you like to receive notification about upcoming events or are interested in the jobs we have, um, email us at socialdatascience at uv.edu. Um, again, thank you all and uh, well, um, have a good end of the semester. Bye-bye.